What's up everybody? Welcome back. In this video I'd like to start adding some more gamey elements to our engine. So right now we have a guy walking across the screen, he can jump up and down, and we have some basic collision detection to stop him from running through walls. I'd like to give him the ability to fire bullets and we can also put in an enemy into our level and if the bullet hits the enemy will play an explosion sound effect. And on top of that, I'd also like to put a background image behind the player and the enemy so we can start to have the feeling that we're in some type of game world. So let's dive right into that. Before we can start coding, we'll need to bring in some assets that I have provided. So if you go to the Michael Hicks toolbox, we need to bring in some art and some audio and a font as well over into our game project in Visual Studio. We will use a font today to draw the score on the window so whenever we blow up the enemy, each time we blow up an enemy we'll add one to the scoreboard and we'll have the score displayed on the top of the window. Let's go into the art folder here and we won't use all of these images today but just for the sake of doing this one more time and never doing it again let's just copy all of the images over so I'm going to drag and drop all of that into the content folder and it says that pixel already exists I'll hit yes to replace it and also yes to replace the sprite then uh, I'm going to left click the 128 grid and then hold down the shift key and click sprite sheet and that will highlight all of these PNG files then down here in the properties window I'm going to say copy to output directory copy if newer that way all the images get copied over next to our exe and next let's right click the content folder and let's make a new folder inside of the content folder and we'll call it audio this will contain all of the audio for our game let's go back to the Michael Higgs toolbox go into the audio folder and here we have a WAV file called song and a WAV file called explosion. Let's do the same thing and copy these on over. This time we'll drag them inside of the audio folder. Next we will click on both of them using the shift shortcut that I showed you earlier. And let's say copy if newer. That way these get copied as well. We can close the audio folder and then let's create one more new folder. Uh, add new folder and let's call this one fonts. These are the fonts that will draw text or numbers onto the screen. In the Michael Hicks toolbox I have provided a font called Arial and this is the basic Arial uh, font that we all have installed on our computers, very default and normal. Uh, let's copy that over. Same thing, let's say copy if newer. Alright, and now we have all of the content inside of our game and it's ready to go. So now that we have all of the content inside of our game engine, inside Visual Studio, let's go ahead and create a new class. I'd like to start with making a bullet class. It'll be pretty straightforward. Basically we'll just have an image that draws and then moves in a certain direction every frame. So if we fire the bullet to the left, it'll move to the left every frame until it either dies off after a certain amount of time or it hits a wall or an enemy. Okay, so let's say add class. Let's name it bullet.cs. Hit add. First things first, let's copy over the using statements from one of the other classes. I'm going to go to player.cs and copy these over. We'll paste it at top. Let's make the class public so everyone has access to the bullet class. Inside of the class, I'd like to make a const float called speed. I'm going to set it at 12F. And this is how fast the bullet will move. So feel free to play with this number later on after the video is over. Maybe you want the bullets to move a little slower or you want them to move faster. But keep in mind that if you have the bullets move really fast, 
they can potentially jump through items, <laughs> okay? So if we have a wall, and we're, let's say the wall is 50 pixels wide, but our bullet is moving 60 pixels per frame, hopefully you can see that the bullet will just skip right through the wall, and that's not going to look correct on the screen. It's going to look like, hey, why didn't the bullet <laughs> uh, hit the wall and be destroyed? So keep that in mind, but feel free to play with that more if you want. Next, I'm going to make a character called Owner, and the owner is who fired the bullet. So this will be useful to keep track of who fired the bullet so we don't kill ourselves, <laughs> right? Um, we can also use this to access other things inside of the character, like where the character is positioned. Next, let's make an int called Destroy Timer. And sometimes in games when a bullet is fired and it's not going to hit anything, we don't want the bullet to keep firing forever and ever and ever and ever until the game is exited. That's going to be a waste of CPU power. We'll just make a timer, and after like three seconds or so, the bullet will just automatically destroy. So after three seconds, if the bullet hasn't hit an enemy or has hit a wall, we'll just remove it. All right? Next, let's make a const int called max timer. I'm going to set this to 180. Remember that 60 frames are called every second. So 60 times 3 is 180. So this should make our timer 3 seconds long until destruction. Next, let's make a constructor called public bullet. Let's immediately say active equal to false because we don't want the bullet to be active until we fired it, right? We don't want to start all of these bullets immediately active we would kill ourselves or <laughs> kill, cause all types of destruction, I'm sure. Um, oh, and look, it's throwing a red line. And that's because we don't have access to the active bull. And that's because we forgot to inherit from the game object class. So every bullet is a game object. So we can say game object after the colon. Notice we now have access to the active bull. The lines went away. Next, let's make a public override void for the load function. And here we will set our image. So let's say image equals texture loader dot load. The file path should be bullet because that's what the image is named. And we will pass in the content manager. The bullet image, if you didn't take a look at it, is just a basic little red circle. So <laughs> there it is in MS Paint. Nothing special, okay? Just a little programmer art I put together. All right, next, let's make an override of the update function. And here, we can start off by saying if active equals false, return. So we'll return from the function immediately if there's nothing to update. First things first, let's update our movement. So remember, just a second ago I said each frame will want to move in the direction that we've been fired. And we should have access to a direction vector. And we can set the direction vector to be, obviously, the direction we're firing. Okay, so if direction.x equals negative 1, we're firing to the left. If direction.x is 1, we're firing to the right. So we can use that in our calculation. Let's just make this simple. Let's say position plus equals direction times speed. So this will move our position vector in whatever direction we're firing, and it'll be multiplied by the speed, which will make us move at the appropriate speed we defined earlier up here. Next, let's update the death timer I was talking about. For each frame, we will subtract one from the destroy timer. So destroy timer minus minus will subtract one. If destroy timer is less than or equal to zero and active is equal to true, we will destroy the bullet. But let's make a helper function for that. 
Um, we haven't created one yet, so it's going to complain. But we'll make a helper function called destroy below down here. Let's do that real fast. I'm going to make a public void called destroy. And in here, we'll just set active to false. Whenever you have a batch of code that you're going to call multiple times, it's always good to make a helper function like this. That way, if you ever need to change the inside of how this works, you, you just do it one time, and all of the places where you call this code will automatically be updated. So we want to call destroy if the timer is zero, okay? So that's taken care of now. After three seconds, the bullet will automatically destroy. But we also want to destroy the bullet if we determine that there's a collision. So if the bullet collides with a wall or it collides with an enemy, then we would also destroy it and call our destroy function. So let's make another helper function below update. And let's make it a private void called check collisions. Let's pass in the objects and map from the update function up here. And inside this function, we will iterate through all of the objects in our level, and we'll see if our bullet is currently colliding with any of those objects. So let's say for int i, for as long as i is less than objects.count, i++, plus plus, If the current object that we're looking at is active, because we don't want our bullet to collide with someone who's already been killed, right? If the object is active and the object is not our owner, remember earlier I said we can potentially kill ourselves, <laughs> right? As soon as we fire the bullet, it's going to detect a collision with ourself. So we want to make sure it's not the owner that's firing the bullet and objects i dot check collision with our bounding box if that is true then we've detected a collision and we will destroy the bullet let's call return because we can exit this function there's no reason to keep checking for collisions because the bullet's been destroyed it won't hit anything else. But here we need to do something else. Because imagine that we've just fired a bullet and it's hit the enemy. We've destroyed the bullet. But remember earlier I said I want the enemy to explode. Right? We'll play an explosion sound effect. So how would we do that? Well, we could make a custom function in each class uh, to call. So when we make our enemy class later, we could make a function called destroy enemy inside of the enemy class, but it's quite possible that we have a whole bunch of different game objects that need destroyed. Well, I imagine in our final version of this game, if we were continuing to develop it, we would have bosses and different types of enemies. So why don't we just make a function inside of the game object class called damage response, and that will do all of the basic damage things like kill off whoever's been shot, but if we want to add additional functionality, uh, say different enemies have different dying sound effects, we can override that function in the deriving classes and add extra functionality on top of this. So this is saving us some work. Um, let's go to gameobject.cs and down here underneath the draw function, I guess, let's make a new function called public virtual void bullet response. For now, let's leave this empty. We can fill this out later when we make our enemy class, like I was talking about. We can override this function and add uh, a custom sound effect. We'll make him blow up. But now, back in our bullet.cs class, we can call objects i dot bullet response. So this is super handy. This function will immediately be called whenever a bullet collides with an object. And then in the deriving classes, we can figure out how to respond to the bullet. OK. Let's call this function up in our update function right here. We'll say check collisions, passing in objects, 
and finally map. All right, this is cool stuff, right? Pretty straightforward, pretty easy. We now have a bullet that moves and it checks for collisions with objects. Oh, but we, what about walls, right? We haven't checked for that. But luckily that's super easy. Remember in the previous videos, we made a function inside of map called check collisions or just check collision, I'm sorry. And whatever rectangle we pass in, that will check that rectangle with all of the walls in our map um, and that's exactly what we need to do. So this is pretty straightforward. We'll just say if map.checkCollision passing in our bounding box if that is not equal to rectangle.empty that means it's returned a wall that we've collided with and here we can just say destroy. Alright? There's no reason to have any other type of response except just destroy the bullet because it's hit a wall. All right. Now I believe it's done. <laughs> uh, but we need a way to actually fire these bullets now. So remember, the goal is to have our player fire these bullets. But maybe in the future we would want enemies to fire bullets at us too. I imagine that this should be a separate class. We can make a class called Fire Character and any game object that wants to fire bullets can just derive from fire character and have the ability to shoot bullets. So once again we're saving ourselves work. Um, in the future when we want other things to fire bullets we'll just say hey derive from the fire character class and all of the functionality will automatically be inherited. So let's right click the game engine go to add class and here I'm going to call it fire character. Let's do the routine things that we always do for every new class. Let's go to bullet.cs and copy over all of the using statements. Paste them here. Let's make the class public because we want everyone to access the fire character. And fire character will derive from character. Every fire character is a character the difference is if you're a fire character, you're a character that fires bullets. <laughs> okay? So, there's different ways you could implement this. But the way I like to do this is by creating a pool of bullets. And we can put, let's say, 20 bullets into this pool. And whenever the player presses the fire button, we'll go through the pool of bullets and see if there's any bullet that has not been fired yet. If we find an inactive bullet, we'll take it from the pool and then we'll fire it and make it active and it will fire off in the direction that we're looking. So this is nice because as soon as the bullet is destroyed, we'll just say that the bullet is no longer active and then put it back into our pool of bullets to be reused later. It's a way to recycle the same things over and over. That way we don't have to keep creating uh, new objects every single time we want to fire a bullet. So let's go ahead and implement that. I'm going to make a list of bullets called bullets. Oops. Below here, I'm going to make a constant int called num of bullets. And like I said, this is how many bullets we want to put into our pool. I'm going to say 20. Below that, we can make our constructor. Let's leave it empty for now. Oh, wait. <laughs> Why did I name that constructor bullet? I'm sorry. It should be fire character. Wow, that's an embarrassing mistake. All right. And then here we can override the initialize function and when initialize is called we can look to see if our bullet pool has been populated with bullets so if bullets dot count equals zero that means that there are no bullets currently in our list or in our pool of bullets right so if that is true we have nothing in there we want to put bullets in the list so let's just say for int i equals zero for as long as i is less than num of bullets, i plus plus, and here we'll just say bullets.add 
parentheses, new bullet, and then semicolon at the end. So this will add 20 bullets to our list. Pretty straightforward. And then down here we'll say public override load. And this is where we will load all of the bullets. So basically we're just going to call load on every single bullet in our list. Nothing crazy. Uh, actually, let's just copy this for loop here. Paste it. And here we'll say instead of bullets.add, we'll say bullets i dot load, passing in content manager. And now we should have, whenever we call initialize and load on the fire character, his or her bullets will be initialized and populated and then loaded. And as soon as the bullets are loaded, they're ready to be fired. Aw, oh, yeah. So let's go down here to... Oh, wait. The bullets are not ready to be fired yet. Let's, let's actually, uh, before we do that, let's override the update function, and we need to call update on all of the bullets. That way they actually move, right? If we don't call bullet.update, the bullets will just stand still and not move in the direction they need to move. So here we'll say bullets.update, passing in objects and map. <laughs> oh yeah, and we need to make the bullets draw. <laughs> okay. So then, you know, I'm sure I'm sure you can guess what we're about to do. We're about to override the draw function and then just call draw on every single bullet in our list. So yeah, this code isn't that interesting. <laughs> okay, it's pretty straightforward and a little repetitive, but uh, this will take care of all of the bullets for us, making them draw and all of that good stuff. Cool. Yep, passing sprite batch to that, and now, finally, <laughs> we're ready to write the one function that's new and interesting in this class. Um, let's make a function up here called fire. And this will be called whenever we want to fire a bullet. Let's start by iterating through all of the bullets in our list and we want to look for an inactive bullet that hasn't been fired yet and once we find that bullet we'll fire it. Okay? Again, pretty straightforward. If the current bullet that we're looking at is not active. Let's call bullets i dot <laughs> Did we not write a fire function? I swear we did. Yeah, I guess we didn't. We didn't we didn't make a fire function. I'm sorry. Well, that's 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 fine. Let's just pretend we have a function that fires the bullet. And as soon as we fire that bullet, we will break out of this for loop. That way we don't fire off all of the bullets at once. <laughs> okay? So without this break right here, it's going to be like firing a shotgun. <laughs> a really powerful shotgun that fires 20 bullets all at once. Okay? Maybe you want that. Maybe you can experiment with that later. Um, but yeah, for now, let's break out of that. And let's create a fire function back in our bullet.cs class. So down here at the very bottom, I'm going to make a new function called fire. And it's going to take in a character. That's our owner. It's going to take in a position that we want to fire at. And it's going to take in the direction we want the bullet to fire. So, pretty straightforward. We're going to set our owner to the owner that was passed in. We're going to set our position to the input position that was passed in. And, you guessed it, <laughs> we're going to set the direction to the direction that was passed in. But now we need to do two more things. We need to make the bullet actually move, right? Because right now the active bull is set to false, so nothing is going to move until that bull gets changed. 
So we'll say active is true, which will make all of that code up here be called. That moves our position. And then we also need to set our fire timer or I'm sorry, our destroy timer to max timer. And that will set our timer to three seconds and after three seconds the bullet will be destroyed. All right. So now we have all this functionality written. I don't think that was too difficult. I, I think most of this stuff's pretty straightforward. It's just kind of organizing all of the bullets in the list and making sure the list is being updated and drawn and all that stuff, right? But this is pretty straightforward stuff. We're just moving an image in a direction and then checking for collision detection and destroying the bullet if we detect a collision. All right, no, nothing crazy. Now we can go to our player.cs class and we want our player to be a fire character. Right now he's just a character, but as soon as we inherit from fire character, he will become a character that can fire some bullets. Down in the check input function below, let's go underneath this else, all right? And let's say if input dot key pressed keys dot space. So if we press the space key, we'll fire a bullet. Just call the fire function, and that should be it. <laughs> Pretty simple, okay? Um, after the last video, you're all probably like, yeah, I'm, I'm ready for some simple code. <laughs> but I, yeah, it's, it's, it's getting easier, see? This is pretty simple. Oh, wait. I spoke too soon. We need to pass some stuff into... <laughs> we need to pass some stuff into this function. We have an error here. And... Yeah, back in the bullets uh, where, where we call fire on the inactive bullet, we need to pass in some parameters here. Um, so it's asking for an owner, and the owner is obviously us, right? So we can just pass in this, because we are firing the bullet. For the input position, let's just pass in position, and then same for direction, we'll just pass in direction. And if we're looking to the right or looking to the left, that will tell the bullet what direction we want to fire. All right. Now, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm right this time when I say this should be done. And we can press F5 and hopefully we fire some bullets as the main player. All right. Here we go. Here's our guy. I'm going to press space. Oh, yeah. Check that out. There's some bullets, and you can see the little bounding box around the bullet, too. Um, let's see. I'm going to try to shoot the wall. Oh, okay. <laughs> nice, right? So check that out. I, I can fire bullets against that wall right there, jump and shoot, and the collision detection is working because you see the bullet disappear as soon as it hits the wall. Uh, that's pretty cool, right? Pretty cool. We're starting to get the basic skeleton of some type of game here. But now we need someone to shoot. Remember earlier I said I'd like to add some enemies to our game. So why don't we do that? That sounds fun. I'm going to exit out. And let's create a new class up here. Let's right click game engine, go to add class. And let's call the class enemy. Let's do the basic stuff we always do. Hopefully you know what that is by this point. We're going to copy the using statements. And then make the class public. So all enemies should be characters. So let's derive from character. So we inherit all of the functionality from that class. And let's think this through a little bit. We could have one enemy on the screen. And then as soon as you destroy that enemy, the enemy goes away and that's the end of the game. But that's kind of boring, right? Who plays a game that just has one enemy, you know, you get one point and then you just stand there and the game's over. That's that's not cool. So what I'd like to do is as soon as the enemy is destroyed, we will respawn a new enemy at a random position somewhere on the map. So Let's make some variables for that. I want to first make a timer called respawn timer. And as soon as an enemy gets shot, we will wait one second 
before respawning a new enemy. All right. That way we give a little bit of time for the player to enjoy the explosion <laughs> as the enemy they shot uh, was destroyed. Okay. So below here we'll say const int max respawn timer equals 60 because 60 is one second. Below here let's make a class called random. And I can't remember if we've used this in the past in, in any of my other videos. But basically, this is a random number generator. And whenever you call it, it will return a random number between a specific range that you specify, right? So if you pass in 0 through 100, it'll give you a random number somewhere between that range, okay? Let's make a constructor. And let's also... Um, in this constructor, we'll add a parameter called input position. That way we can create new enemies at a specific point in the map. I'm going to say position equals input position. And it's also always a good idea to have empty constructors as well, because later when we start trying to save out our levels into files, the way we do that, it always looks for these empty constructors. And if you don't have them, it causes problems. Um, so let's have that, and then down here, we'll say override void initialize. We'll call initialize whenever we want to respawn a new enemy. So we'll say active equals true. Let's also say collidable equals false, that way we can walk through the enemy. And then here we will say position.x equals random.next and here this was what I was just describing we can pass in the minimum value and the maximum value so this is the range of numbers that we want a random number to be returned in I'm going to say 0 for the minimum value and 1100 for the max value remember the width of our screen is something like 1280 so this seems like a pretty safe number to throw in Below the initialize function, let's make a load function that overrides. Here we will say image equals texture loader dot load enemy is the name of the enemy sprite we put in the content folder earlier. And we can also pass in the content manager. Let's override the update function. And whenever we are destroyed, when the enemy gets hit by a bullet, we will set the respawn timer to 60. And then in the update function, if the respawn timer is greater than zero, we will count down that timer by saying respawn timer minus minus. So each frame it takes off one. And as soon as the respawn timer hits zero, or less than equal to zero to be specific, we will call initialize. And remember, initialize sets our active bool to true and gives us a random x position. Finally, the last thing we need to do for this class is we need to make a override of the bullet response function we put in game object. So remember earlier I was talking about how this is called whenever a bullet hits an object and then the deriving classes, so that would be enemy, here we can override the function and do specific things for how we want to respond to that. For us I'd like to say active equals false, so stop drawing us and stop updating us. And then we'll set the respawn timer to max respawn timer. So that starts counting down and respawns us when it hits zero. We'll also eventually want to do some other things in here, like play a sound effect and increase our score on the scoreboard. But for now, let's press F5 and see if... Oh, wait. No, we can't press F5 just yet because we need to actually add an enemy to our object list, right? So go back to game1.cs. Hopefully you remember doing this. This was a few videos back. But down here in this load level function, 
See here, this is where we said objects.add new player. We also need to add a new enemy to our level. Okay? Pretty simple. I'm going to control C, control V, and I'm going to say new enemy. And we will start him at the position of 300x. Uh, some, let's say 522 Y. This will be randomized later on, but I believe 522, if I remember right, that should start him right on the floor. Okay. So now let's press F5 and see if this does anything. <laughs> okay. So it does. So on the left, we now have an enemy sprite. And shout out to one of my best friends. Gonzalo Antunes, he is the artist for all of the games I've done in the last few years, Pillar and the Path of Modus. These sprites are from Pillar, and he drew them, so thank you, Gonzalo, for letting us use these. I'm going to fire a bullet at the enemy. He goes away, and notice there's that split second where nothing happens, and then a new enemy is randomly brought in. It's not really a new enemy, right? We're, we're kind of hacking this. It's the same enemy as before. We're just putting him in a new position. But that works, right? It works for what we're trying to do. Um, I'm going to keep shooting at him here. So see, he responds to the right, to the left. He responds all over the level, just like we programmed him to do. But now... <laughs> Now I'm going to hear some explosion sound effects. You know what I'm saying? Like this is cool. Like I, I like shooting people and them going away, but I, I need to hear some. Uh, I need some reinforcement, some audio reinforcement. So let's exit out here and uh, go back to enemy.cs. And at the very top here, we're going to make a sound effect to play whenever the enemy gets destroyed. So I'm going to say uh, make a new instance of the class sound effect. I'm going to call it explosion because that's what it is. Then down here in our load function, we can load in the sound effect that we put in our content folder earlier. So here I will say explosion equals content dot load because remember our content manager, that's where we load in any type of assets, audio, images, that's all handled through here. We call this texture loader class to load in textures, but underneath, if you actually look at the code I've written for that, it's using the content manager, okay? Um, but here we're going to say content load, and then we're going to use these arrows, and inside these arrows, we define what type of asset we're loading. We're loading a sound effect, so we will type that in. Then you will use an open and close parentheses like that, and this is where you'll pass in the name of the asset you want to load. Remember that we put all of our audio content inside a folder called audio. So the asset name will actually start with audio slash slash. Make sure you have two backslashes here. There's also the forward slash, but the forward slash will cause you problems, okay? So make sure you have the backslash here, two backslashes. And then the name of the file is called explosion all lowercase now we've loaded in the sound effect all we have to do now is play it at the appropriate time and the appropriate time would be inside of the bullet response function so whenever we get hit with a bullet we will say explosion dot play this will play the sound effect and notice we have some options here um, there's three different parameters you can pass in here there's the volume, the pitch, and the pan. The volume, obviously, is how loud you want the sound effect to play. The pitch lets you change the pitch of the sound effect. So if you want it to be really high like this, you would use, I believe, a negative one, and that would pitch shift the sound effect up. If you want to pitch shift the sound effect to be really low like this, you would use one, a positive one, for the pitch. For the pan, that lets you, uh, so if you ever have listened to music with headphones on, sometimes things will play on the left side of the headphone, other times it will play on the right side of the headphone. The pan lets you control where you want the sound effect to come from, the left side or the right side, or the center, right, if you set it to zero. 
Again, you would pass in values ranging from negative 1 to 1 on that. Um, I'm just going to leave this empty and play everything at the default values right in the center at full volume and at the normal pitch. I was just explaining those things to you if you want to play with them later, okay? Because they are useful things to know. Let's press F5 and see if we get some explosion sound effects. All right, so there's the enemy to the right side. I'm going to press fire. <laughs> Hopefully you heard that. I'm not sure if that comes through on the mic, uh, but yeah, we got a nice little sound effect there. Check this out. Yeah, I like that. That's that positive reinforcement sound I like to hear. Let's check that out again. All right, good job, everybody. Um, it's always cool to put in audio because that's when I feel like, at least for me, that's why I feel like things start to come alive when you have things playing in the audio and you start to have some nice images. But wait a minute, we don't have any nice images. We have this, this uh, cornflower blue background. We need something a little more visual, a little more aesthetically pleasing. Luckily, we can easily do something for this. Let's go ahead and exit out. <laughs> 